So, meine Damen und Herren. Ladies and Gentlemen, my dear friends, I would like to welcome you most cordially to the 15th Annual Foreign Policy Conference of the Heinrich Böhr Foundation. So this is a kind has turned into a foreign policy institution here in Berlin. And I'm very happy about the uh, um, turnout, which is very impressive this year. So I think this does not only have to do with a very interesting and international agenda that we have put together, but I think it also has to do with the political times and uh, situation in which this conference is currently held. And this is why this uh, conference is really dealing with uh, very pertinent, very recent issues. I would like to welcome the representatives of the diplomatic corps in Berlin. I would like to welcome the um, staff and uh, members of uh, many think tanks, academies, foundations, non-government organizations, and everybody here from the media. And I would also like to welcome not least everyone who out of uh, citizens' interest has uh, found the way to this conference. So some of you might be disappointed that the concept of the conference has been slightly modified compared to the previous years. After this public kickoff today, there will be a continuation of this conference in the form of an expert conference for a limited number of uh, participants tomorrow. This was no easy decision for us. We did not take it lightly. This, of course, had to do with cost restraints at the time of scarce resources. But at the same time, we also wanted to work in a more focused way, result-oriented way on day two of the conference. And we wanted to find a form of conferencing that will enable an intensive sharing of opinions. We would like to therefore document the results and outcomes and make them publicly accessible. So in recent months, foreign policy has moved to the fore of the public debate in Germany. Our German president, Gauck, demanded that Germany would have to intervene Early on, in a more determined and substantial way, Foreign Minister Steinmeier said that the culture of military restraint should not be mistaken for a culture of um, a keeping out of conflicts. Uh, and uh, Defense Minister van der Leyen said that uh, indifference was no option. What I'm talking about here is more responsibility of Germany when it comes to international affairs. In public, this is contested. According to a recent survey, 60% of the respondents said that Germany should keep out of international crises, and only 37% were pleading in favor of a more decisive commitment. Comparing this to a survey from 1994, this is a kind of a turning upside down of the outcomes of the results. So the more crises and the more conflicts in the international situation, uh, the more Germans tend uh, to fear of being involved in those conflicts. But looking at this from a different perspective, we simply need to find out what we understand by an enhanced international responsibility of Germany. Being responsible for one's action or for one's inaction is what always happens. This also holds true for German foreign policy. This is just something it is not always perceived. For a very long time, the former West Germany felt very comfortable in its special role. Security was ensured uh, by NATO. Foreign missions of the German army, the Bundeswehr, were not up for discussion, and we could completely concentrate on economic cooperation and global trade. After we opted for the integration into the West and the European integration in the 1950s, there was only one major foreign and security policy initiative of the Federal Republic, and this was the detente policy that will always be associated with Willy Brandt. Up to the very day, it is shaping the foreign policy concept in Germany, securing peace through dialogue, cooperation instead of confrontation, change through rapprochement. After the fall of the wall and the end of the bloc confrontation, it seemed to be the time for a new era of peace, uh, disarmament, and cooperation. And this uh, hopeful expectations was, first of all, deceived 
with the war on the Balkans uh, that at the beginning of the 1990s was started by Serbia. Aggressive nationalism, ethnic expulsions, and genocide were back on the European agenda. The first uh, war in Iraq, the Kosovo conflict, the genocide in Rwanda, Russian military expeditions in Chechnya, the terrorist attack uh, of September 11th, and uh, the ensuing intervention in Afghanistan were further landmarks uh, of a highly unpeaceful development of the international situation. And uh, they also posed uh, some decisions or some needs for decisions to the Federal Republic that were highly contested, especially when it came to the participation of the Bundeswehr in international missions. So in the past 25 years, we have lost our foreign policy in a sense. The rest of the world, especially our allies, have less and less of an understanding for the fact that Germany, and always referring to its own history, would like to keep out whenever it is about the tough questions of international regulatory policies. Enforcing peace, intervening against genocide, militarily deterring powers that are wanting to expand their territories, the conflicts with violent extremist movements. Poland's foreign minister, Radek Sikorski, just put this in a nutshell when he said, German power is what I fear less today than German inaction. In the past few weeks, Rather, last week I went to a Polish-German seminar on the perspectives of the Eastern Neighborhood Policy of the EU. This was a highly impressive experience. In Poland, across uh, the uh, political spectrum, there is a considerable irritation with regard to the expectation of a temporary strengthening of NATO presence at the Polish eastern border and why this is perceived in Germany as saber-rattling or as expansionist rhetoric. Because for our Polish neighbors, uh, this is a matter of solidarity within the alliance. But it is far too short-sighted to just reduce the current debate on uh, strengthened international commitment of the Federal Republic to military questions alone, because what is at stake is the future of the international order. And its destabilization has even accelerated throughout the past years. And one catalyst of this was certainly the second war in Iraq that was started by the US with a coalition of the willing in order to overthrow Saddam Hussein and in order to bring about a new um, order in the Near and Middle East. And this by ignoring international law and the United Nations. This war of choice turned out to be a costly failure, costly in every respect, with regard to human lives, um, but also politically and financially. And it is still taking its effect uh, to the very day with the bloody wars uh, that at the moment are shaking Iraq and the entire Middle East, even if the American intervention is not the root cause of these conflicts, it has opened Pandora's box. So today we are confronted with a number of dangerous developments around the globe, and they are clearly over challenging the capacity of the international community to manage conflicts. Crises are developing faster than the skills to manage those crises. And this holds all the more true because the UN Security Council is blocked increasingly through the new polarization between Russia and the United States and is no longer a force to be reckoned with in order to restore order. In the case of Syria, as well as Ukraine, the Security Council is paralyzed, even though this is about elementary issues of the UN Charter and the international peace order. So what uh, we are faced with is a menacing new fragmentation of international politics, a disintegration into rivaling powers and power groups. A hundred years after the beginning of World War I, these are disquieting perspectives. The times are over in which uh, the German stereotype could just sit somewhere and uh, drink a beer while um, whenever they're in Turkey far away, the folks are out bashing one another, as uh, is stated in Goethe's Faust. So we might want to ignore global conflicts, but they are not ignoring us. In a globalized um, world that is connected through trade, investment, internet, and migration, and ever closely so, 
a stance which says without us is no realistic perspective. Uh, with, be it in Ukraine, be it in Iraq, this is always about our affairs, about our future security, and about the question in which world we would like to live in the future. Well, we fall back into a world where what is most important, what counts most uh, is uh, the right of the stronger, or do we commit uh, to international law and democracy as normative basis for our international order? This is also a matter of the capacity to act and the self-esteem of a European Union that perceives itself as a community of values and political projects. You can argue endlessly um, how far the wish to regulate of the EU should go. But um, nobody should doubt uh, the necessity of a common European security and foreign policy in view of uh, the turmoil that exists around us. So the requirements towards the EU as a foreign policy actor are increasing also because the willingness and the capacities of the United States to act as a global political power are reducing. So the short unipolar moment, the discussed American age, discussed by many, has come to an end before it has really started. The US is also confronted with its political, military, and financial limits. And um, the um, reach of uh, this development has not yet uh, really also uh, been digested by many over here. So um, the uh, slogan um, of asking the Americans to go home is something that many feel in Germany is a good prospect. But when the Americans go home truly and genuinely, they leave behind them a vacuum, security policy vacuum, that is then filled by forces, by states uh, that take no respect when it comes to democratic elections or a critical public opinion or an independent judiciary. This does not make things better, especially with regard to our eastern and southern neighbors. The European Union will have to assume more responsibility. In the Near and Middle East, the old order has um, disintegrated the Arab Spring is uh, buried now under a wave of violence and repression. Iraq and Syria have turned into a major battle zone and the old colonial borders are simply overrun. Lebanon and uh, Jordan are also menaced with uh, being coming part of this conflict. Um, regional regional uh, primacy and other political and religious conflicts um, are mutually reinforcing. All of this is happening at our doorstep. Wait and see. Maybe the better alternative um, to blind actionism, but it does not replace an act of European policy for the region. And the example of Syria shows that a policy of non-commitment, of non-engagement is not leading to a peaceful development, but can even stir the escalation of violence. The conflict uh, in Ukraine is also posing a threat to the post-Soviet peaceful order in Europe. The annexation of Crimea, the intervention of Russia in eastern Ukraine, the wave of the popular nationalism that is also being stirred by Russian media lead back to long bygone times. So with good reason, you can criticize the um, hesitating power political naive Eastern policy of the EU, but also the old political elites of Ukraine have a co-responsibility for today's crisis. But we should never um, question where the core of the problem lies. Um, this is the Russian power elite around President Putin that has given up the way of democracy and partnership with the EU. Russia today is a deeply authoritarian power that um, has uh, executed a neo-imperial change um, to the outside and sees itself as a counterpower to the United States of America. Instead of integrating into a pan-European economic and security community, Russia wants to gain back privileged zones of influence. The Bezhnev doctrine of the limited sovereignty was again taken out of um, the um, history and historical past. So if the EU buys into it, it's not only going to betray the declared will of the major majority of the Ukrainian society, it is also gambling away its own credibility. Tomorrow, we will deal with two more 
questions of German and European foreign policy, and this in a more intensive way. We're talking about the um, Eastern policy of the EU and the new alignment of our Russian policy after a partnership for modernization with Russia has turned out to be wishful thinking. The second big issue is going to be the future of the transatlantic alliance. Is the West a normative uh, and alliance political category, or are we already on a drift that is leading to a growing alienation and distance between Germany, Europe, and the United States. There are many reasons um, for voicing criticism when it comes to American politics, unilateralism of the Bush, Bush years uh, up to the surveillance practices of the NSA. Question is uh, what we are actually talking about. Are we talking about a decoupling from America or a renewal of the West, uh, especially with regard uh, to um, the uprising of authoritarian and fundamentalist forces in the world? It would be detrimental to just um, give up the transatlantic alliance instead of perceiving it as the core of new multilateralism and a cooperative foreign policy. So I would like to most warmly thank all our colleagues who have prepared this conference and organized this conference. First of all, I would like to thank our partner, the European Council for Foreign Relations, that um, for a number of times um, has uh, co-organized and is co-hosting this uh, conference together with us. So thank you very much for the good cooperation. And then I would like to thank Gregor Enstern. He is our uh, a specialist for foreign and security policy and his team. I would also like to thank uh, the colleagues from the public relations department and the conference department, and I would like to thank the many speakers that have followed our invitation and that um, are truly turning this conference into an international forum. And now, it is a special pleasure for me to announce Professor Heinrich August Winkler. He is going to give the input speech for our conference on the lessons from the age of the extremes. What does international responsibility of Germany mean for us? Professor Winkler, like nobody else, is predestined to give a speech on this topic. He is not only one of the most eminent historians of Germany and also of Europe with a wonderful capacity of uh, explaining historical issues in, uh, uh, in a popular and in, in a very easy to understand way. He is also a historian who is uh, a public intellectual in the best sense of the term and in uh, the books for and for them he's become popular the long way to the west was one title and uh, then he also published a series on the history of the west and he was precisely looking into the um, topics that play such an important role for the current debate that is ongoing in Germany. These are very long lines of uh, German and European history that uh, are becoming very important today. So I'm looking very forward, very much forward to your presentation, Mr. Winkler, and I would like to ask you to come here to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuchs, for this wonderful introduction. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The Age of Extremes was the memorable title of Eric Hobsbawm's book about the 20th century. No other country has as much reason to reflect upon the short century as Germany does because no other country shaped the first half of this century as much as Germany did. This is true not only due to the significant role that the German Empire played in causing the First World War, the great seminal catastrophe of the 20th century, but also 
because without active German help, the seizure of power by the Russian Bolsheviki in November 1917, an epochal event that was of crucial importance for two other takeovers by totalitarian movements, that of the Italian fascists in 1922 and of the German National Socialists in 1933, would not have taken place. That World War I was followed a quarter of a century later by World War II was not inevitable. But again, the later catastrophe cannot be explained without the seminal catastrophe of 1914. Germany was part of the West, culturally speaking. It had joined in the great European emancipatory processes since the Middle Ages, or even, in the case of the Protestant Reformation, set them in motion, and it had taken part in the European Enlightenment. Its ruling elites had refused, however, to accept major political consequences of the Enlightenment in the shape of the inalienable human rights, the sovereignty of the people, and the representative democracy until well into the 20th century. World War I was waged by the German war ideologues as a war of the ideas of 1914 against those of 1789. Liberté, Egalité and Fraternité were pitted against the declared belief in strong government, the Volksgemeinschaft and a German socialism. The Weimar Republic, the first German democracy, was regarded by the political right as a result of defeat, as the polity of the victors and thus un-German. The culmination of the German resentment against the West and its normative project, the ideas of the American Revolution of 1776 and of the French Revolution of 1789, was the rule of nationalism, national socialism, sorry, the German catastrophe, as the historian Friedrich Meinecke termed it in 1946. Only after this second, now complete defeat in the 20th century, did Western democracy assert itself in Germany, or at least the Western part of it. This was the result of a conjoint effort of the Western allies, led by the United States and the Weimarians who had learned their lesson and now became the mothers and fathers of Germany's Grundgesetz, those who had survived the Third Reich and were able to draw conclusions from the failure of democracy in 1918-19 for the building of a robust and functioning parliamentary democracy. The Federal Republic's Western integration and its contribution to the Western European unification process, undertaken by a center-right coalition led by Konrad Adenauer, were highly controversial at first. This changed with the Social Democrats' historical course correction in 1959-1960. A quarter of a century later, during the Historica Streit in 1986 about the uniqueness of the Holocaust, Jürgen Habermas described the unconditional opening of the Federal Republic towards the political culture of the West as a great intellectual achievement of the West German post-war period of which his generation in particular can be proud. The philosopher's verdict gave birth to an era of posthumous Adenauer left, an informal coalition which, during the decade after Germany's reunification, even the Greens joined. Until the restoration of German unity, both German states enjoyed only limited sovereignty. 
After reunification, the rights reserved by the Allies with respect to Berlin and Germany as a whole ceased to apply. But the reunited country found it difficult to come to terms with its newly gained sovereignty. This became clear as early as during the first Gulf War, but even more so in the wars of Yugoslav succession in the 1990s. The Federal Constitutional Court's out-of-area decision of 1994 provided legal clarity about the conditions under which humanitarian and or military actions of the German armed forces were permissible beyond NATO's borders. In the following year, on the 30th of June 1995, the German parliament, with the votes of the Christian Liberal Coalition, approved the deployment of the Bundeswehr for the protection and support of the Rapid Reaction Force in Bosnia and Herzegovina. A majority of Social Democrats, most of the Green Party and the PDS voted against the mission. The Social Democrats then General Secretary, Günther Verheugen, expressed his disappointment with the 45 party members who had broken ranks and voted in favor of the deployment by reminding them that, even after the great changes in Europe, Germany could not become a normal country, like other countries, without such an abnormal history. Those who will still not believe this should ask themselves what the newly opened Holocaust Museum in Washington means. Another three years later, Germany was confronted with the issue of its international responsibility once again. On the 16th of October 1998, just few days before the formation of the first coalition government between Social Democrats and the Green Party at federal level, Parliament voted on the Bundeswehr's participation in a potential NATO operation against the aggressive Serbian actions in the Kosovo. Now, the mission was approved by a large majority, including the votes of most Social Democrats and members of the Green Party. Once again, the Holocaust played a significant role in the justification of this humanitarian intervention, but this time as an argument in favor of an intervention intended to prevent genocide of the Kosovo Albanians. The reference to the National Socialists' crime against humanity may also have been used to counteract the residual doubts of the governing left about whether it would be possible to bring peace to the war-torn region by military means. But unlike in 1995, in 1998, 99, almost all of the members of the Social Democratic and the Green Party were prepared to accept the consequences resulting from the increase in sovereignty obtained in 1990. Germany acted in concert with the other Western democracies, and it was left to small minorities to advocate a special role in view of the German past. Since the turn of the millennium, the use of Auschwitz as an argument in current policy debates has become less frequent, and that is a good thing, because every reference made to the annihilation of the European Jews in the context of current events carries the danger of instrumentalizing and thus trivializing the most horrific event in German and European history. To refer to the unique nature of the Holocaust for the purpose of not condemning other, more recent crimes, or in order to put them into perspective, simply means that the reference to Auschwitz is being used to desensitize the audience to a violation of human rights. If such an argumentation is made in earnest, it must surely be the expression of a pathological learning process. Germany's integration into the West always included close ties to the leading Western power, the United States. This did, however, not mean an unconditional subjugation to Washington's positions as to what they perceived to be Western interests. 
the refusal of the Social Democratic Green Coalition to participate in the Second Gulf War was well justified, both under international law and under political con con considerations, and represented an act of emancipation from an America which, under the leadership of George W. Bush, was calling its own fundamental values into question. This transatlantic conflict does not indicate the dissolution of the Western community of values by any means. When Europeans and Americans argue about fundamental issues, it is almost always a question of differing interpretations of common values. This applies to controversies about death penalty and the state monopoly on violence the relationship between religion and politics, a country's social and ecological responsibility, and not least, and most recently, in connection with the NSA's global surveillance, the precedence of individual freedom over national security or vice versa. Western political culture has always been a culture of debate as well. It is based on the insight that Western democracy's common ground is solid enough to withstand differences, and that these differences can even be regarded as opportunities for the further development of the common normative project. The tensions between the United States and parts of Europe did not end with the younger Bush's presidency. In one case, the debate about a humanitarian intervention in the Libyan civil war Germany's ill-considered abstention in the United States Nations Security Council meeting on the 17th of March 2011 put it in opposition not only to the United States but also to two of its Western European allies, that is France and the UK. This represented an unprecedented self-isolation on the part of Germany. Germany's proven culture of restraint with regard to military interventions, a phrase coined by then Foreign Minister Klaus Kinkel in 1994 and frequently co quoted by his fellow Liberal Party member Guido Westerwelle, Germany's Foreign Minister during the Conservative Liberal Coalition government from 2005 to 2009, took on a whole new meaning on this occasion. Important Western allies increasingly started to regard it as a euphemism for an evasion of responsibility motivated by domestic policy considerations. A new, now more or less pacifist German special past. It is against this backdrop that federal president Joachim Gauch repeatedly and rightly urged Germany to assume more international responsibility, a responsibility which corresponds to the economic and political weight of Germany in Europe and in the world. When it comes to defending peace and human rights, this may ultimately also include Bundeswehr operations. For quite some time now, the triple crisis of the European integration process has been added to the existing strains on the transatlantic relationship. The first of these, the Eurozone crisis, may have peaked by now, but it is far from over. The second crisis arises from the endangered state of democracy in several EU member states first and foremost Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria. The extent of this threat to the European Union's cohesion continues to be underestimated, not least because Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban enjoys the backing of the Conservative and Christian Democratic parties united in the European People's Party while Viktor Ponta, his social democratic counterpart in Bucharest, has count on the understanding attitude of the European socialists. The two big party families appear to have reached an unspoken agreement to treat the other parties' victor as they would have their own victor treated. 
Therefore, everything speaks for the suggestion made by political scientist Jan Werner Müller to appoint an independent Copenhagen Commission, which would, upon request by the EC or as the result of a petition, act where there is reason to believe that a member state is in violation of the 1993 Copenhagen accession criteria and recommend sanctions wherever applicable. The third crisis of the European integration process is the legitimation crisis of the European project per se. As manifested most recently in the electoral gains of populist parties on both sides of the party spectrum in the European Parliament elections at the end of May. Concerns pertaining to the increasingly independent momentum of the executive power in Brussels, by the way, a term coined by Karl Marx, are not new and they are largely justified. For far too long, decisions affecting the future of the community, not least in connection with the expansion process, have been made behind closed doors and were presented to the public as fait accompli. The outcome of the ongoing power struggle between the European Parliament and the European Council is uncertain. In principle, a parliamentarization of the leadership of the Commission would be a step in the right direction because it would strengthen the European Parliament vis-à-vis -vis the Council. This holds true regardless of widely held doubts about whether the actual candidate proposed by the old Parliament leadership is the right choice for the EU's political progress. The Conservative Spitzenkandidat, it's a German term that is now making inroads into English, is seen even by large Swathes of his own supporters as an embodiment of Europe's, Europe as an elitist project and of the carry-on-as-before attitude of a political class that seems to regard ever closer union as an end in itself that no longer requires justification. In a conversation with Niels Minkmar, Jürgen Habermas in the Frankfurter Allgemeine of May 13th asks those heads of state and government who want to see Jean-Claude Juncker leading the Commission to suggest an exit from the European Union to the countries opposing this outcome. Otherwise, the supporters of the more successful of the two most promising Spitzenkandidaten would be risking their own reputations as Democrats. He continues, I quote, in the case of an impasse, there's always the option to reconstitute the European Union in its existing institutions, a threat that not even Mr. Cameron should be able to ignore, unquote. An objection from Viktor Orban's Hungary against Juncker as president of the European Commission can indeed be safely ignored by a majority of the European Council. But the resistance of the UK is another matter. The British Prime Minister's ideas about a retransfer of responsibilities from Brussels to the nation states are a lot more worthy of discussion than anything Orban has suggested and expects from the EU. Germany and Europe cannot be interested in provoking a British departure from the Union, which is a distinct possibility as it is. Nor can Germany have an interest in lastingly alienating the Netherlands and Sweden, who also have expressed reservations about Juncker as president of the EC. A European Union without these three countries would be more illiberal protectionist and crisis prone than the current club of 28. And even the exit of just the UK would significantly weaken the community on the global stage. A collision course that would result in such a radical change of the EU cannot be an option for the German government. Even the mere impression that Germany is rushing through an institutional reform of the EU as it sees fit would be counterproductive. 
if the parliamentarization of the leadership of the Commission could succeed without negative consequences for the unity of the EU, it would be a step in the right direction, but still far from what has been and must remain a long-term goal of German politics. That is the European Union's further development into a political union. In other words, a fundamental reform of the EU. This goal, however, is tied to a number of prerequisites, one of them being a common political culture. This can only be the political culture of the West, a culture that the EU has embraced both in the Copenhagen criteria of 1993 and in its Charter of Fundamental Rights of 2000. As the cases of Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria show, this is far from a consensus among the EU 28 for the time being. A political union would moreover require a fundamental agreement of all member states with respect to the foundations of an economic and fiscal reform agenda. An agreement that could only be achieved by means of a Europe-wide public discourse. However, such a reform-oriented consensus does not exist even where it would be most required, that is, within the monetary union and between its two biggest members, that is, Germany and France. A closer union of the member states in favor of reform, a union within the union, sort of, without France, cannot be Germany's aspiration either as such a construct would fatally resemble the kind of Central Europe that the liberal politician and writer Friedrich Naumann, at the time regarded as a moderate Wilhelminian imperialist, advocated in his book Mittel Europa in 1915, that is almost 100 years ago. It would be the path from a German half hegemony towards a complete hegemony of a Europe. As long as there is no solid consensus for reform between France and Germany, which has been made even more unlikely by the Front National's victory in the European elections, the only option remaining is thus an increase in intergovernmental cooperation, even in areas not yet communitized, included but not limited to foreign and security policy, and this is what Ralph Fuchs has just pointed out. This kind of cooperation can certainly not be the final word on European policy, but as long as the Lisbon Treaty remains effective, the EU will depend on it to an almost existential degree. How important it would be for Europe to speak with one, one voice is shown clearly by the Ukraine crisis. Future historians will probably come to the conclusion that the year 2014 was the end of an intermediate period in history, the time period that started a quarter of a century ago with the peaceful revolutions in Eastern Europe, found its historical symbol with the fall of the wall on 9th of November 1989, and filled the world with the hope that the ideas of the Atlantic revolutions of the late 18th century would prevail, if not globally, then at least in the entire area of the then as yet existing Soviet Union. Now, the West will have to give up on this hope for the foreseeable future. Fourteen years after he was first elected president of Russia, Putin has made his intentions clear. He regards the Russian Federation as the counterbalance to the supposedly decadent West, as the speaker on behalf of all those powers in our multipolar world who oppose the universal applicability of human rights, as a friend of homophobes the world over and, in Europe, a reliable ally of all Eurosceptic parties across the entire political spectrum. Of all those who want to decouple Europe from America and break up the North Atlantic Alliance. 
After the annexation of Crimea, an act of ethnic nationalism that violated against that violated international law, Putin was given the benefit of the doubt, not only on the left and the right fringes, but also from the Committee on Eastern European Economic Relations of the German business associations, active CSU politicians, some SPD elderly statesmen, and a surprising number of influential journalists. This worries some of the East Central European member states of EU and NATO, and justifiably so. Some people are beginning to wonder how deep Germany's Western integration really is, and whether Berlin would honor its commitments and be loyal to its allies if push came to shove. The supposedly good tradition of German-Russian special relations that is held in such high regard by supporters of the alternative for Germany and others is liable to evoke memories of a very different kind in Poland, those of the history of German-Russian good relations, ranging from the partitions of Poland in the late 18th century to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in 1939. Germany does well to take the security interests of its East Central European neighbors, its partners in the EU and NATO, at least as seriously as those of Russia. If NATO had rejected the aspiring members after 1991, East Central and Southeastern Europe would have become a zone of insecurity and instability. A new intermediate Europe, as in the period between the two world wars, in which nationalist and anti-democratic forces would have gained the upper hand almost everywhere. Germany has no reason to seize in its efforts to defuse the new East-West confrontation through diplomatic channels, to urge a national dialogue in Ukraine and a return to a policy of peaceful reconciliation of interests in Moscow. At the same time, however, German governments must make it abundantly clear that solo actions and seesaw politics between East and West are no options for Germany. In other words, that Germany's Western integration is irrevocable. The German opening towards the political culture of the West is the most important lesson drawn from the age of extremes. The commitment of Western democracies to the normative project of the West is only credible, however, if it is accompanied by a critical evaluation of the past. The ideas of 1776 and 1789 did not describe the realities of their time, but they provided the standard against which the West has had to measure up ever since. The project thus became the corrective of a practice that pursued the direct opposite of the proclaimed values often enough. It developed a dynamic that turned the project into a process and this process will not be complete until the inalienability of human rights is accepted worldwide. The West would give up on itself if it were ever to give up on this aim. The same applies to Germany, which, seen from a historical perspective, still counts among the young Western democracies. Thank you for your attention.
So, dank, 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 dank. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Winkler, for coming full circle with regard to the uh, paper you gave for kicking off our conference. And I think that uh, many of the topics you were raising in that paper will certainly be discussed by us in the following discussion in greater detail. And uh, this for tonight, then we're going to continue our debates with a discussion spinning around the core issues of what a stronger European responsibility of uh, the uh, Federal Republic of Germany can actually be about. What are the expectations towards European foreign policy, especially when it comes to our neighbors and allies? And which is the role the Federal Republic of Germany should assume in the context of a European foreign policy and the transatlantic alliance, that is NATO, because we can no longer discuss foreign policy these days in national categories alone. And uh, we cannot only confine it to European categories either. And this is why the panel is composed the way it is composed. We have guests from Poland, from France, and the United States. And we have one voice from Germany that you have already heard before, and another voice that we will hear in a minute. Let me start by presenting our guests. On the opposite side of this panel, Beata Penska is our guest. She is the plenipotentiary for the Eastern Partnership in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland in Warsaw. And before, she was serving in Brussels as the ambassador and representative of Poland to the Political and Security Committee of the European Union. Before this, she was the vice representative of Poland at the United Nations in New York. So thank you very much for joining us here. A warm welcome to you. Dr. François Eisbourg is our next panelist. He is a special advisor with the Foundation for Strategic Research in Paris. He looks back on a long career in the diplomatic service of France. Uh, since the 1970s, he's been active there from 1979 to, from 1987 to 1992. He was the director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. Then he was working in the uh, armament industry in France, if I can see this correctly, and then he went back to the universe of the think tanks. So he is, amongst other things, uh, the president of the International Institute for Security Studies, and he's a member on many board of trustees and many other bodies. So welcome to you, Francois. Let us now speak about Catherine Kluver. She is the founder and director of the Future of Democracy project at the John F. Kennedy School of Government in Harvard. This is the project that is dealing with the special challenges of international politics and uh, governance in the 21st century. Before, she was working in the field of journalism and international communications, but she also worked in European politics at the European Policy Center in Brussels. There she was a member of the directorate managing team. She knows the transatlantic relations from both perspectives. And this is therefore a special connection that she can talk about with regard to Germany and Berlin. So she will talk about this in a minute. Welcome to you as well. Professor Winkler, we already heard, and Chemet Stamir, I think I do not have to introduce to you in 
this venue. He is one of the chairpersons of Alliance 90 the Greens. He is a member again of the German Bundestag. He used to be so from 1994 to 2002. Then he also had a brief excursion to the European Parliament where he was the foreign policy spokesman of the parliamentary group of the Greens. And then he returned to national politics again. And in our political club, he is a person who all along the way has dealt with foreign and security policy issues in a very intensive way. A most warm welcome to you, Chair. So I would like to ask Beata Pexa to take the floor and respond to the paper of Mr. Winkler in the way you wish but maybe also contribute your own ideas and your own points with regard to the key topics of our topic for this conference towards greater responsibility for Germany. You have the floor. Is it on? Yes. Thank you very much. And uh, let me first of all start uh, by uh, uh, expressing my thanks for the invitation for this uh, important event. I think that discussion is uh, very much uh, on time uh, in this very difficult time. So um, thank you that uh, you have chosen uh, uh, me for uh, presenting uh, your Eastern neighbor uh, perspective uh, on this, uh, uh, on, on, on the position of, of Germany in the current, uh, in the current uh, politics. Uh, and of course, oops. Uh, and of course, you uh, uh, provoked me, you know, already during the, the first uh, introduction to uh, while uh, uh, while talking about uh, uh, our minister of foreign affairs, Mr. Sikorsky, who was uh, talking about uh, you know a fear of uh, 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 inaction of Germany in the, in, in current times. Uh, but let me uh, remind you, it was, uh, I guess, a while ago already, time has passed, you know, we were in an absolutely different situation at the time, of course, of the crisis, but economic crisis in Europe, uh, beginning of the, of the political crisis, uh, but internal political crisis of Europe. Uh, and still, we were not at the time aware of uh, the situation of the of the of the how the history will evolve and how, uh, especially uh, in our eastern neighbourhood, the situation will evolve. So uh, uh, one may wonder: uh, Are those words of Minister Sikorsky uh, are still valid? And I would argue that they are even more valid, especially when it comes to uh, the um, uh, position uh, and our cooperation with Germany in the European uh, Union, in Europe, but also but also globally. Uh, because it's it, it is it is it is true that history is happening uh, now. Uh, maybe it is very difficult at this moment for uh, analysts uh, to um, define uh, where the world order, how the world order will look like in a few years, because uh, um, uh, at this moment we are in the in the situation when globally um, uh, there is, uh, I would say, repositioning of the of the certain powers globally, not only in Europe, not only in Eastern Europe. Uh, there are also crises happening uh, uh, in the in the southern neighbourhood. But also, uh, but also in other parts of, of our world, and and of course, you know, especially you know the approach to the uh, to the uh, issues of uh, the the, the uh, corner docu uh, documents of the of the international law. Uh, were, uh, have, have, have changed uh, dramatically, not only during the Crimea crisis. Unfortunately, it was happening uh, also before. And if you if you talk, for example, with professors that deal with the uh, international negotiations and conflict resolutions, they may actually, you know, uh, 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 I, I'm not going to do this at this moment. Uh, but also, they are pointing, you know, at the certain uh, on, on on certain issues and and problems that we were facing um, uh, during the last decade, uh, um, uh, in the, especially 
in the Security Council, but uh, but uh, in the global um, uh, law, uh, international law uh, order. But this time, of course, what happened with Crimea, uh, uh, the, the 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 annexation of Crimea, the use of international law or misuse of international law is something that, of course, uh, should not be should not be forgotten. I think, and and should not be neglected. And of course, from Germany, that uh, we still hope. Uh, I mean, the, that uh, is uh, that Germany still have this uh, ambition to become uh, a member of the Security Council, the permanent member of the Security Council. Though the discussions uh, on how the, the, the this body will look like, uh, um, uh, perhaps will. Um, uh, will be continued for for years, but the ambition was ambition was there. Uh, so of course the expectations are also uh, much higher than from uh, any other country. Uh, that uh, we would expect, of course, perhaps not you know the the military uh, power or the military presence, uh, but uh, uh, Germany uh, Germany are definitely you know able to have initiatives. Uh, uh, they have very good diplomats. They have very good businessmen. So uh, uh, it's it's not just the question to go and vote in the in in, in the general assembly. It is to uh, work with other countries uh, uh, using economic means, using development means, uh, and to uh, and to uh, uh, influence also uh, thinking of others. And of course, it is also not to stop others. And uh, that was again the provocation from. The beginning, uh, from the from the uh, your first intervention, it, it, uh, it is it is also not to block others from uh, you know trying to defend or at least to deterrent uh, um, uh, themselves. So so for sure we would we would expect you know more um, uh, more support from uh, from from Berlin uh, in the in case uh, something in in case the situation worsens, but but also of course deterrence deterrence must must happen uh, now. Uh, we uh, also uh, uh, talking about uh, Eastern uh, policy, of course, we uh, we would expect uh, that uh, uh, Germany uh, would take a kind of a lead in Europe together with uh, with other uh, countries uh, 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 in resolving the situation uh, with uh, with Russia. Uh, not only through dialogue, but also through other means. Uh, dialogue is important, but it has to be uh, not just uh, uh, talks uh, uh, describing the situation, but presenting, first of all, our European, or I would even say European and American, uh, because we are together uh, in, in, in this, uh, position and our interest. And uh, uh, we know that uh, our Russian colleagues, they like to have uh, tough negotiators, uh, and not only those who would uh, listen to them. Uh, we had uh, an example. We had an example recently. There were talks in St. Petersburg with uh, Minister Wavrov, Mr. Sikorsky, and uh, Mr. Stalmeyer. There were good talks, of course. Well, uh, maybe they uh, <laughs> still. Um, uh, uh, we are still far from resolving the situation, but you can you, you can see that we can talk together uh, in a, in a tough way. And of course, uh, you know, when it comes to to Poland, it is uh, you know. We definitely respect that uh, Germany is perhaps not as emotional as we Poles, or uh, we, uh, or our colleagues from the Weimar Triangle, our French colleagues. Uh, maybe it's good to have someone who is a little bit more sober, uh, but <laughs> but uh, uh, but we work through the consensus, uh, and and of course when uh, when there is a need, uh, when there is a need, uh, we would also hope that uh, our uh, emotion and approach will be respected and will be supported, especially when we are right. Uh, and finally, um, finally, two remarks because I do not want to prolong. I'm open for any questions, of course. Uh, uh, I was I was I was driving today to Berlin uh, by car from Warsaw. Uh, uh, thank God I was on time because it was it was really uh, close. Uh, and and uh, I, I was driving with my daughter, uh, and st I started you know to discuss the issue also with her. And I realized, and this is something that I would like to also to say here, also to to to, to Professor Winkler, but also to to the whole audience. 
uh, the, uh, we, we have to, of course, we have to look at this moment at the younger genera generation. The generation that now finishes colleges and universities, this is the generation, uh, this is the generation that, uh, uh, that grew up uh, without the Berlin Wall, that grew up in, the, in, in Europe, in the, in, the, in the free world. And, uh, and of course, we have to teach them about, uh, about the history, about the very difficult history uh, in Europe. Uh, we perhaps have this uh, pulse in our genes because uh, we are a little bit more sensitive to the situation, but, but definitely you have to teach about the history. Uh, but also that what we have to teach the young generation is to teach them responsibility. And uh, uh, and to uh, to uh, um, uh, to help uh, to 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 know that that they they need to know how to preserve to preserve democracy, how to preserve the achievements of tolerance that is that is now vis so visible in Germany, and how to preserve the, the 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 spirit of cooperation within the Europe without borders. This is this is this is also I think our responsibility at this moment. Uh, because uh, well from the uh, let me uh, give you an example from the from just from life if there is a car accident or someone has a heart attack on the street you may be penalized uh, you know by the by the penal court at, by, of your inaction uh, if you if you just uh, pass by definitely that's the case of, of our law in Poland I'm sure that this is also in other European countries uh, uh, when you are inactive when the human when human rights are being uh, neglected or uh, where, where you see genocide uh, uh, well uh, people will think you know well we have to respect the, the, the position so let me finish with recalling you know uh, going back to what uh, professor Winkler was talking about the Holocaust and recalling, you know, the very important person or name in 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 our history. This is uh, Mr. Jan Karski, who was the courier from the from the Poland uh, occupied Poland uh, to the to the uh, uh, UK and the and the and then US, who was talking and uh, and who was a witness of what was happening to Poland. But uh, well, the the first reaction was the non-belief and non-action. And uh, this is something that, of course, you know, that was a very painful thing in our history. But when now we uh, observe uh, the change in history, we definitely would not like to be uh, uh, blamed. Uh, no, no one, no one in Europe uh, uh, and in the in the uh, Western modernized world of the inaction. So let me finish with this, and uh, I'm of, of course open to other questions. Thank you very much. That would, was enough stuff for the debate for, for the, the whole evening. Um, but we will have another um, inputs, maybe from different perspectives and, and angles for our conversation tonight. And the next will be Dr. Francois Eisburg. Th thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Because as a long-time analyst of foreign and security policy, nothing is more pleasing than to see close to 300 people actually coming to participate in a discussion on these, uh, on these topics uh, on, on, on a weekday. Uh, uh, this is marvelous. Uh, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen this happen in exactly this sort of way in France. And, and God knows if we're interested in foreign security policy. Uh, uh, so th this feels very, very good. Uh, I'm going to, uh, after having listened to uh, a beautiful speech, uh, sir, that was a great speech, uh, and I, I wish it will be trans. I would very much like to see it translated into English and French because it really does deserve uh, to be read. Uh, uh, far beyond the confines of, of this building and, and beyond the confines of the German language. Uh, I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to make a few comments. Uh, and the question is a real question. I'm not a politician. So uh, I, I actually ask questions to which I do not know the answer. Uh, 
and that may be dangerous, but and I'm not a politician. Uh, in in a way, and this may be a little bit of a caricature of what you said, uh, you unfolded a narrative in which Germany progressively becomes a more engaged country, somewhat less restrained, operating alongside its her allies. Uh, 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 with the, vari the different steps uh, the, during the 90s, Bosnia, and then, of course, Kosovo. And then you mentioned emancipation, and you jumped to Libya, which was sort of attributed to the flakiness of Guido Westerwelle. Uh, now, that is, that is a narrative which I can understand, except that from my side of the world, in my neck of the woods, uh, the actual narrative doesn't feel that way. Yes, there was a narrative of progressive German engagement during the 90s. First, from the CDU, with uh, Chancellor Kohl and Volker Rühr as the defense minister. Uh, uh, small baby steps initially, Cambodia, Somalia. Uh, then the much bigger, more difficult step in, in Bosnia. And the crowning moment of this process, uh, Kosovo, in which Germany uh, participates in the use of brute force, not simply, uh, you know, Germany was not acting like a caveat country. It was a fully fledged partner in the Kosovo air campaign and subsequently in the NATO K4, in the K4 uh, ground force deployment. Uh, and all of this, without there even existing an, a proper, uh, reasonably fresh, enabling Security Council resolution. And also at that time, we had the beginnings of European security and defense policy. We had, uh, uh, and uh, 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 pro, uh, Dr. Fuchs, you, you reminded me of my past sins as part of uh, the defense industry. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, you are absolutely right. And one of the great things that was accomplished at the time was the creation of uh, EADS, which is now known as Airbus. A, uh, a Franco-German endeavor of enormous complexity, enormous complexity, and yet it was done because everybody was pulling in the same direction. Then we have emancipation for all of the good reasons which were mentioned in uh, Germany and France and others were uh, very strongly against the war in Iraq and this reminded us uh, rightly so. Uh, but uh, we don't jump straight away to Libya with Libya being a sort of fluke. No, we have a Germany which progressively gets into caveats in Afghanistan. We have a French-German security and defense relationship which progressively shrivels up and I, I speak here as an eyewitness. I've, I've been participating in uh, what one calls in the jargon the track 1.5 French-German strategic meetings over the last years. It's pretty pathetic. And, uh, I, I, I underline those words even if we were on the air. Uh, 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 and when uh, it became clear that we had to take the EADS, the Airbus project, one step further by bringing the British into the system. Germany blocked it. And when I say Germany, I don't mean Guido Westerwelle. I mean the government of Germany, the Chancellor of Germany. And in the case of Libya, of course, Guido Westerwelle had, his, had, a, vo had a voice in uh, deciding what to do in the Security Council, but I understand that the Chancellor uh, did not try to stop him. Uh, uh, she is the Chancellor of Germany today, by the way. I mean, uh, uh, nor, did the uh, nor did the Defense Minister. So I think we have trouble which is rather deeper. That is, I think we have gone backwards. We, uh, if Kosovo presented itself again, I don't think you would be handling it at all the same way you did 15 years ago, 14 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, in Libya, we had a a full, fresh, enabling resolution of the Security Council. In the case of Kosovo, we didn't. Uh, so, 
First, I'd be interested to see what your reaction to my counter-narrative. And if my counter-narrative has some validity to it or not, I, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. What explains it? Uh, is this a, a, a durable Zondarweg uh, of passivity rather than a Zondarweg of assertiveness? Uh, is this something which is explained by what I call uh, sometimes third-generation assertiveness uh, interest in the sins of their grandfathers and their grandmothers? You know, we, all, we all know about the third-generation syndrome. You know, first generation, the one which has gone through the events, wants to forget them. The second generation wants to rebuild. And the third generation is the one which starts asking difficult questions about Auschwitz, about uh, uh, the Holocaust, etc. Uh, uh, or is this indeed the first post-Cold War generation, which doesn't take security and defense seriously anymore? Ian, I was listening to what you were saying, Madame Penska. Uh, 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 it's a hypothesis. Or is this simply the long, deep, German shadow of Iraq. I say German because, of course, in France, uh, the shadow has not played at all the same, the same role. It certainly hasn't restrained us. Uh, the comments, three comments. Uh, first, on memory. I entirely agree with the points you made, uh, Professor. The risk of instrumentalization and so on. Uh, uh, but, of course, there is no escaping memory even if we don't want to instrumentalize. In the case of Kosovo, uh, we had, uh, uh, we had a, a big debate in Germany as to which element of the memory should have primacy. The memory of the Third Reich as an aggressive power or the memory of Auschwitz as something the world didn't do something about in good time. And it was the second one which uh, it took precedence over the first one. Uh, in the case of Libya, to take a much more recent event, in France, uh, uh, Sarkozy, who's not my favorite politician, uh, uh, but Sarkozy said, as one of the basic justifications for what we did, and he meant it, and this, this was actually, he was not being instrumental about this one. Uh, because uh, not everybody understood what he was saying, uh, 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 and there was a lot of background noise, if I can put it that way, but he was saying, uh, I can prevent a new Serebrenica in Benghazi, and since I can do it, I will do it, because the last time when we could do it in Serebrenica, we didn't do it. So memory inevitably comes in, and it comes all the more in when you are facing an antagonist, which was very well described by several people here, uh, and that is by Putin. Putin is bringing in memory. He is bringing in the memory of Barbarossa, he's bringing in the memory of fascism, he's bringing in the memory of anti-Semitism, instrumentalizing them to the hilt. We cannot let this pass. We must be offensive, we must be strong in making the reminder which you did, Professor, about Molotov-Ribbentrop. Oh, yeah, Soviet anti-fascism. Yeah, great. Uh, great. Great track record. No, it's true. The Soviet Union did not attack the Third Reich. It's the Third Reich which attacked the Soviet Union. But that is not proof of the Soviet Union's anti-fascism. It's rather the proof of the Third Reich's anti-Sovietism. Not quite the same thing. And as for the memory of the Holocaust, there would be a lot to say about the way that memory has been handled in both the Soviet Union and in contemporary Russia. Uh, so, uh, uh, I don't know if there are folks from the media here, uh, but I would like to see our media as strongly engaged in the battle for the memory as the Russians are. <laughs> Second comment. Not in the same way. No. <laughs> I mean, we have one big advantage. 
our narrative is uh, how to how to put it uh, spell checked proof checked by the great historians <laughs> it's true uh, we have that advantage we are in an open society we cannot say just anything which passes through our heads uh, and that is a strength third a second comment very briefly uh, the eurozone crisis uh, the acute market-driven phase of the crisis is no doubt past us, as you said. The problem is that we're now entering into the political phase of the crisis, where electorates are simply no longer taking the economic, accepting the economic policies which have been up imposed upon them by their governments. And I say the governments in the plural, I'm not giving the French government or other governments a free pass and saying it's all the Germans' fault. No, it's not all the Germans' fault. Uh, but the policies that we are led to follow, that our electorates are told to follow, those policies are now being rejected. This is what happened in France on the day of the European elections. And we are now moving to a stage where politicians on the right and on the left are both saying, Madame Le Pen will probably be the front runner in the first round of the presidential election in 2017. If that is not a crisis, I don't know what is a crisis. Fourth and last comment. <coughs> uh, Ukraine, Russia. I already mentioned it. Uh, but I'll simply add a couple of words. Uh, some people say this is not a return to the Cold War. And they're right. You didn't do so, I don't do so, and, uh, and it is, I mean, we should be well advised not to, uh, not to reach back to the Cold War. No, Putin reaches back to before the Cold War. Annexation was not part of the uh, Soviet uh, toolbox post-1945. Annexations were the sort of things which are done in the days of traditional empire. The last annexations in Europe go back to the immediate post-1945 period. Uh, he is moving back a very long time, uh, a longer time. Another thing which is sometimes said is that Putin is only about pure power, uh, pure brutality, pure empire. Now, I have no doubt that it is about power, that it is about empire, uh, but uh, first of all, I would not emphasize Putin's brutality. Uh, Putin is a man who tends to use minimal force, not maximum force. The way he took over Crimea was a masterpiece of minimal use of force to achieve a strategic objective. This guy is really smart. He is what the Russians would call a seriosny chelovyek, serious man. Uh, I wish we were just as serious as he is. Uh, but I would add another thing. It's not only about empire and force and strategic cleverness. Uh, it's also, and the words here may sound a little bit shocking, but it's also about the value system. Because some people say, well, yeah, it's not like the Cold War because it's not about the value system. Because in the Cold War, we had, the, we had a value system called communism. Well, Putin is definitely not a communist, but he has a value system. He's politically autocratic, he is socially reactionary, and economically illiberal. Uh, uh, this is a value system, uh, which has strength. The Chinese like it. Uh, many dictators love it. Uh, many of the more reactionary forces within our own societies like it. You know, in France, Germany, you have people like that. You know, the alternative for Deutschland was mentioned, I'm not going to get into German politics, but in France, in France, you have Marine Le Pen, but you look at, look at the editorial line of Le Figaro, right of center newspaper, you know, not extreme right. And of course, uh, 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 they are not, uh, they are definitely uh, not alone. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, first of all, I would take on board what you said about the recommendation vis a vis Germany that is no seesaw politics vis a vis Russia. But the same must apply to France. Pas d'alliance de revers. 
that is what we call that's uh, uh, seesaw politics in French. Uh, uh, we had we played Alliance de Revers before 1914 for fairly obvious strategic reasons. Uh, during the Cold War, it was some it was a game we sometimes also played. This we have to stop. This is not going to be this is not going to be easy. Just a very last word. It's something which I forgot to say. Uh, about the instrumentalization of, of the politics of memory. Uh, what is striking in the way Putin uses memory, or his people use, use memory, is that uh, it is not we who are reaching the Godwin point. You know, you know what the Godwin point is. Uh, it's the point where in a discussion, when you are reaching the point of intellectual uh, bankruptcy, you start comparing what you're talking about with uh, Hitler and Chamberlain. Uh, it's Munich. You're doing Munich again. This is appeasement. Uh, uh, this is like uh, Poland in 1939. This is like the Czechoslovakia in 1938. This is like the Anschluss in Austria 1938, etc. Uh, it's not we who are reaching the Godwin point. It's Putin and his people who are reaching the Godwin point. He, they are the ones who are, re who, who are delving into those folds, those strands of, of memory. And one of the most egregious pieces, but also one of the most interesting pieces on this, was written by Sergei Karaganov, whom uh, a number of people here in the room know, who's one, who, was, who was one of uh, Putin's intellectual uh, uh, sources of, of inspiration. A very good analyst, I would add, an extremely professional man. He wrote, he wrote a, a very interesting article in the British press recently, where he essentially compared today's Russia uh, to the Germany which eventually stopped Erfüllungspolitik uh, between the two wars and saying we are like Germany when Germany started rejecting uh, the Treaty of Versailles. It's quite an interesting comparison when you think about it. It's, uh, it personally, it scares me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Vielen herzlichen Dank. Oh, thank you very much. Now, let's come to the American, or rather the transatlantic perspective, Ms. Kluver. Yeah, I also would like to thank everybody here. It's nice to be back home. It's my second home, but I wasn't invited for my red passport, but for my blue passport. I will try not to mix any personal pronouns and always talk about we so that you can follow me. This is sometimes sort of difficult for me because I identify with either side and I show empathy for both sides of the Atlantic. So let me now continue in English. So thank you. I could not have agreed with many of the points you made more um, than, than, I, than I did. I kept writing down three small letters in the English language, which is the word yes. Um, the, the main thing, the, the one thing that we didn't talk about very much in the speech, and I, I wish we would because the debate about whether Germany is actually part of the West is not a, a debate that's heard in the United States, at least not fully. And if this is really a true functional debate here and you're supposed to believe the German press, then it is something that's not finding sufficient resonance in the United States. Uh, and so I wanted to look back at one piece of history which uh, you left out, which was the entire drive toward a Europe whole and free. Because when we were in the negotiations about what a reunified Europe would look like, you had a whole faction, of course, of uh, the German political elite that was very honestly contemplating neutrality and was very honestly contemplating what a neutral Germany, a large behemoth of almost 80,000 people, at that, 80 million people would look like uh, in the middle of Europe. And it was left up to the Americans, James A. Baker III, Francis Fukuyama, and Dennis Ross, to dig up the Helsinki final act and to say, look, to Mr. Gorbachev, President Gorbachev, um, they should be able to decide. This is what is written in the Helsinki final act. And Germany, the unified Germany, finally chose the West. 
buffered, supported by the United States, and created what was for a long time of maximum of American foreign policy, the achievement of Europe whole and free. And so what a, an American foreign policy today doesn't quite realize or might not fully see, uh, because America is challenged in the way that it is, both across the Atlantic with recent developments in the Middle East, uh, which is clearly back and about to ruin President Obama's foreign policy legacy, um, but also very clearly in the uh, Asia-Pacific area. And so because the United States foreign policy no longer has a very strong and very discernible uh, doctrine, bar its basic values, as we were discussing in this, in this value debate, um, it is driven by pragmatism and potentially an over-reliance and potentially an impatience to see and to sit through uh, internal debates that allies are having. So I would wager um, that German-American relations on the other side in Washington, D.C. are still seen as they're indispensable, and they're both very clearly indispensable nations uh, for different but similar reasons. What the United States expects of Germany and has expected for a number of years is, of course, a reliable foreign policy. And yes, they expect leadership. And if you translate leadership into German, it makes my hair stand up on the back of my neck for obvious reasons, right? But that's not the definition that they mean when they talk about a need for German leadership. They want German creativity. They want German innovation. This debate between are we going to open the floodgates of German military barracks and send German soldiers across the world in complete, uh, in complete ignorance of the German basic law of Article 24, uh, Paragraph 2, that's not going to happen. Nor is Germany solely going to rely, or so I hope, on its diplomatic power. Germany needs an integrated understanding of its own foreign policy toolbox from the American viewpoint. It is diplomacy, it is development policy, and yes, it is also defense policy. But it is in the cognizance and in the entire um, parameters of German legality of international law and of, of course, uh, existing alliance relationships. So while Germany in some ways needs the time to think this through, and thankfully this is now happening uh, under our, uh, see there I go with my personal pronouns, under Germany's um, new foreign minister and with many uh, of the thoughts of the people in this room, a really strategic rethink of what constitutes German strategic interest, what constitutes a livable, a workable German foreign policy, um, Germany is faced, by, is faced with all the realities we've already discussed. You have a resurgence of classic international relations, and it's not just the border relations on its east. To the north, we will see when we get to the NATO summit in Cardiff in a couple months, we're going to have to discuss Arctic policy, because I'll tell you what, Mr. Putin is up there, and he's taking back territory. Okay, So that is going to be the next frontier. So it's classic international relations competition. It is a power game around frontiers, yes. And at the same time, we live in an unbelievably interdependent world of which and from which Germany has profited. Profited. I cannot say this enough because really we, the Germans are the recipient of so much of the benefits that have come with these interdependencies. But that makes a definition of negotiation strategies with the East and thinking through what a functional Eastern policy looks like and what our future relationship or what Germany's future relationship looks like with Russia all the more difficult. Uh, and so I do think that that is, a, that is a debate that we still very clearly need to have out in this country. Part of the reason we need to have it out in this country is what Herr Fuchs already said in his opening words, and that's why this is, as you said, probably the best site for some sore transatlantic eyes, a room full of people who are willing to take on these very difficult questions because we see this disjointed uh, narrative that's feeding down to the German public. The German public has a really hard time understanding from what we can see over in the United States that you can grow weapons exports by 25% 
went in just under a year to some very questionable actors on the international scene and then actively debate to take yourself out of the foreign policy discussion and not use the full gamut of your foreign policy toolkit. I, I, I don't understand that. And I'm a German voter, okay? So, I mean, there are a couple, there are some really blatant inconsistencies. And then it is not a wonder that people are, you're, you're experiencing exactly what you described, this democratic uh, deficit and this democratic disconnect, right? When 17.6 million Germans decide not to vote uh, in the last federal elections, that's a problem. That's a problem for foreign policy. That's a problem for public policy. And you're not explaining your objectives in the way that you have them. Because you know what? Germany has foreign policy objectives. And so it would help the transatlantic partnership. Um, and it would help also the transatlantic partnership in overcoming and working through in a functional way the remnants, and I will tell you, the best person that you could have sent over to Washington, D.C. is Wolfgang Ischinger, because every time he turns around, he talks about how deep the trust chasm is between the United States and Germany because of the NSA scandal, another thing that the Americans haven't fully understood. They need to hear it, and they need to hear it more, so that there can be a pragmatic way of approaching that, setting common goals, and moving this relationship forward. Because God knows, because of these existing interdependencies, we need it. The other thing that the Americans have understood in a way that the Germans have yet to understand it is the interconnectedness of foreign and domestic policy. I walked by a coffee shop today, this morning, side article in the Tagesspiegel about uh, uh, Minister de Maizière warning about the return of ISIS fighters to Europe. Okay, so that is to say there is a clear connection between what we do or what we don't do in foreign policy and how that is going to play out on our domestic shores. Now we wonder about why the Americans are less upset about the NSA spying on them. Well, that's a pact that the Americans made when September 11th happened, and that wound opened so deeply in an American heart in the way that we over here in Europe know, because we've had generations and centuries of war, and we have this narrative that we work through. The Americans hadn't felt that, and the Americans did feel that, and when they did, they signed somewhere on a dotted line away their civil liberties in a way that the NSA situation is not mu as much or ha doesn't have that the kind of resonance it has here. Now, is that right? Is that correct? Do I agree with that? No, that's all open for discussion. But those, the empathy to understand those differences um, is crucial and is crucial in understanding the connection politics and foreign policy is local. And it is going to affect you whether you live in Chicago or if you live in Charlottenburg. So the understanding that there are knock-on effects to in taking international action or not taking international action, that has to be spelled out to both the German and the American public in a way that it finds resonance and in a way that it tries to allay basic fear so that you're going against this democratic, uh, democratic deficit that exists on both sides of the Atlantic, all right? 53% of Americans don't want to see uh, additional engagement outs in, in, in military engagement, and yet you have 20,000 forces in North Carolina standing at the ready to deploy to Iraq. Because the Americans still think if we don't do it, who's going to do it? And the Americans cannot have the feeling that somehow the lives of their soldiers and their veterans are less precious than the lives of their allies across the ocean. If this is a partnership and if we're going to feel those same effects over time. So those are a couple of things. The United States needs an activist Germany. The United States needs a Germany that understands in terms of creative leadership in terms of how these different elements of the foreign policy toolbox are going to come together, how it can make a difference to protect the pluralistic, multicultural uh, values, the human rights narrative that is still in some ways the foundation, or that is still the foundation of the West uh, going forward. And that makes this partnership indispensable, and it makes working through these problems 
absolutely essential. Thank you very much. We now have Cem Özdemir before we give Professor Winkler the opportunity to respond to the different interventions and respond to the questions that were raised. Cem, that was a lot of food for thought, wasn't it? Quite a few challenges raised here, challenges to the foreign and security policy of the Greens that I will now do without torturing you any further. I am looking forward to your contribution. Well, first of all, let me say something that Ralph can never say. You were nice enough to praise us so that so many people are gathering here and showing an interest in foreign policy. I think this has also to do with the Bell Foundation. The Bell Foundation has been doing this for 15 years at a very high level. Having said that, thank you very much to you, Ralph, and your team, because you organize this really in an excellent way. Secondly, after listening to Professor Winkler, I want to say the following. You said, yes, I could also have subscribed to that in German, and it would have been nice to then end the sentence and say, this is the consensus of European foreign policy. But unfortunately, that's not the case. What you said, Professor Winkler, in the ideal case, would describe the consensus of post-war Germany, i.e. how we position ourselves, but that's unfortunately not true. As you said in your speech, it was not only questioned by the usual suspects, no. We have seen dramatic changes in the German debate. Firstly, it has been questioned, by the way, not by everyone. I think you have to be fair here, but by the majority of those who set the tone, that is the left party, but it was also questioned by some representatives of those who actually come from Konrad Adenauer's tradition, that is those who historically prevailed and were right in post-war German history as, it, as regards the Western integration, as regards Western alignment, as regards the transatlantic alliance. And at current, things are falling apart. If you see that the person in charge of transatlantic relations now has a beer with Mr. Putin and used to be the commissioner for transatlantic relations. By the way, we were supposed to do that under seven years of right wing government. It would have been nice to see what would have happened or what has been mentioned earlier, the Libya decision. I mean, it was not only Mr. Winkler, I'm sorry. It was not only Mr. Westerweller that was probably the worst insult that I could make here. It wasn't just Mr. Westerweller, but it was Germany and that's also the chancellor. By the way, it is the, the same chancellor, just to remind you, which when we were in power and when Mr. Schröder was in the US and she attacked the German government saying that we are not right to participate in the operations in Iraq. In hindsight, by the way, this was an absolutely correct decision. And the transatlantic solidarity is also very selective when it comes to Ms. Merkel and those who are in power. So it is a situation where in no point in time it was about German participation. It was just a gesture of solidarity. On the one hand, at a European level, that is with our most important European allies, that is France and the UK, and transatlantic with the US. In the case of Libya, we abstained. And in the case of Iraq, if we followed the lady, we would have maybe sent German soldiers there. You have to explain that logic first, and it was very good that you mentioned it. However, the concerns regarding the culture of restraint that you hear time and again uh, are not uttered by those ladies and gentlemen when it comes to arms and weapons exports. Here we are champions. Those concerns are only mentioned when it comes to our values regarding foreign policy. And here there is a need for discussion. And this need for discussion is not only limited to the German parliament. We also need a public debate. debate. It also includes the intellectuals living in Germany. It also includes public opinion and the media. At the moment, you can see this with the reactions to the Gauck speech and Mr. Gauck's statements. I mean, I was also asked, 
what I think about it. You can't correct so many questions because many questions that are posed to you are totally wrong. And you often don't have the time to correct those wrong questions. I mean, he was asked, should Germany now intervene everywhere? I think my German is not so bad. So I clearly understood what he was talking about. And I think this also tell us, tells us a lot about the need for discussion here in the country. I would also recommend, and one reason for that might be that I have not always been a German citizen and I also belong to a different generation. There shouldn't be a recurrence to national socialism and uh, there should not be references to national socialism on either side. I think this is not necessary. When it comes to finding reasons for the situation in Kosovo, this was not necessary because it was so clear at the time what was at stake. So a reference was not necessary at the time. But one thing should be mentioned, and I think this is the problem of those who try to draw such part of the lessons from 1945. What we have learned from 1945 is not only never war again, but we should say neither war nor fascism again. If you divide the two, then you are in trouble. And this is one of the problems of the current debate, i.e. that the consensus of national socialism has to be never war again and never fascism again. And then you automatically end up with a debate, and I should rather stop here because you can lead this debate much better, with this belated nation like Thomas Mann, Heinrich Mann, you automatically come up with a question of what about our relationship to the F French values, to the values of the French Revolution. And you also come up with a situation in 1914 where, or how did the German intellectuals behave it then? And then also our relationship to the tradition of freedom. So this debate is still on top of the agenda. And I think these are things that we definitely have to discuss. In the end, what would we do differently? We wouldn't do everything differently. In the case of Ukraine, it is clear, and I can say this as an opposition policy maker, you have to be grateful that we have Mr. Steinmeier as foreign minister and not somebody from another party whose name I have forgotten, I think FDP, the liberals. We have to be very grateful about that. But let me say the following. If we need another argument as to why we can not negotiate or must not negotiate with Putin as 28 states, but with a strong European Union, with a strong foreign minister of the EU, then this is what we have experienced in the Ukraine. So one lesson that we have to learn from those experiences is if it comes to the question of who is going to be the president of the commission of the council who is going to be the High Commissioner for Foreign Policy. So the question is, who will these persons be? Will it be people who will have a voice, maybe something also that Mrs. Merkel doesn't like, or will we still have a situation where you have to call the national capitals in order to find out what the position of the EU is? It is now up to us. It is up to the national governments to appoint the right people. You can change many things, and one of the consequences has to be and many of us have claimed that many years ago. The Bell Foundation also conducted a study on that long ago. Energy policy. This is something which Mr. Putin would understand if the European policy negotiated with Gazprom as an EU 28, if we didn't play off ourselves against each other. So there are many things that we can do. And of course, this also includes a an economic minister using the foreign economic law when it comes to a situation where gas from tries to get strategic advantages. It is absolutely adver absurd that you impose sanctions on 50 people in Moscow. However, Gazprom can do whatever it wants here in Germany. And the economic minister is shying away from using the tools that we have here in Germany. So, dear Ralph, we would go a little further here. The most important contribution would be to have German foreign policy within the European Union, within the strengthening of the institutions should be done. This is where our interests are bet best embedded. A strong EU, strong OSCE, strong United Nations. This is, I think, what we have to do and contribute to. Vielen Dank und 
Thank you so much, Professor Winkler. This, of course, was an invitation to a second speech. Maybe I can keep you from doing this and ask you to just uh, limit yourself to a few of the topics and focus on them so that there is a little bit of time left for a debate. Yes, I'm trying to do this in kind of a vulgar way now and try to summarize my reply into three points. Uh, Stanley Hoffman, I heard from him that when there are only three points uh, to a presentation, then you know that this is uh, somebody who is an adherent of uh, vulgar Hegel philosophy. So I would like to come back uh, to the question raised by uh, Francois Heisbourg. In how far is there a linear or progressive learning process that has taken place in Germany? He's right when he puts a question mark behind this because uh, the debate uh, around the abstention from the vote taken in the Security Council in 2011 uh, with a view to the Libya vote that was taken. And this was, of course, something which was set in a certain continuum. And it was, as a matter of fact, not the decision taken by the foreign minister alone, but everything was, of course, done in close alignment with the defense minister and the German chancellor and also the uh, respective uh, heads of the opposition parties. And uh, the outcome was a self-isolation of Germany as it has never existed before. And this also includes uh, a criticism or does not preclude a criticism towards uh, the dealing with the UN mandate because what it was about was this genocide uh, type uh, annihilation of the population of Benghazi uh, that was to be decided about. And the approval of the Security Council was not only uh, legitimate and uh, right based on the facts, but the extensive interpretation of what the mandate can do by France, uh, by the UK, and by the United States after that had many consequences to it including the consequences that were drawn from this uh, and conclusions that were drawn from this by Putin, by Moscow, when it comes uh, to um, the Western interpretation of international law. And here, of course, we need to be self-critical. Um, let me just point uh, to an excellent an analysis of uh, the history aligned, uh, mentioned in International Politique by Andreas Rink, 2011. There, it was really clear how much back then this was uh, something which was a consensus. Yes, there is a counter-narrative that exists. And if we look at the surveys conducted in Germany, you can only be terrified. So in the political class, of course, uh, there is a relative consensus, but this is nothing we can rest on. This event, this conference can also be seen as a contribution to a highly controversial and open discussion that is ongoing in Germany. And let us not just put up with the fact that even more precarious majorities are um, really saying yes uh, to the consequences of the integration of Germany in the Western alliance. But this can quickly change when the political class uh, is not providing enough of an orientation. And this is sometimes reflected. Major debates in the past years were not really held by the political leaders. And this is a reproach that is not only the actual governing parties that need to be blamed of. The second point I would like to make is uh, Ms. Kluver's uh, point uh, of national or strategic interests of Germany. I would not really want to confirm find this to a national interpretation alone. The question is, can there be legitimate national interests? Can there be legitimate German interests if they are in contradiction to our European or transatlantic interests? And I say no. The legitimacy of German interests is based on the fact that from the outset, we need to consider whether we are serving the overall interest of Europe, 
whether it is empirical or whether it is just an imagined sort of interest. And this needs to become part and parcel of uh, every analysis, and it needs to be a prerequisite of for every analysis. And this then explains many questions that arise uh, from specific material interests of a considerable segment of the German industry, for instance, in the field of energy policies or in the field of analyzing the significance of our relationship with Russia. The third and most fundamental point is concerning what we could summarize under politics of memory. How do we deal with the past? And I would say that a responsible dealing with the past, especially with such a precarious past as the German one, always needs to, to be geared towards uh, making responsible action possible for the present time. So making us free for responsible action. Because if we are paralyzed by the past and the events of the past, then we would become um, guilty again. So in the categories of Sigmund Freud, there is the fundamental difference between melancholy and working on your sadness. When you try to work on your sadness, you are trying to come to terms with the past full of guilt in order to draw the conclusions to become free for responsible action in the present time. Melancholy is just paralyzing. And this is an immense political differentiation we need to make. And what Shem Ertzdemir said about the deeper reasons for what he described as a German pathology, this dates back to uh, bygone times, uh, the ancient catastrophe. And this is not uh, the World War I, but it is the War of 30 years. And what ensued from this was a national trauma, uh, panic whenever it came to chaos, uh, turmoil, civil wars. And this uh, then um, was uh, something which lead to, leads to a great susceptibility uh, towards or to the German absolutism and uh, everything that should be expected should come from the top. The state can do no wrong. Order comes first. So nobody could imagine that Germany would stop one day to be a state under the rule of law. And this was exactly the situation that came about in 1933. So from all of this, we can draw the conclusion that we cannot stop to be self-critical whenever it comes to coming to terms with our past. And we should always be aware of the fact that um, we do not articulate an existing consensus here, but we always need to wonder how should our contributions to the discussion be, how should they be made uh, so that such a consensus can be brought about again, an enlightened understanding of German interests in the context of European and Western interests, just as this uh, can be based on German history. Thank you very much. I would like to add two questions, brief questions, to Beata Pengsa and Francois Heisbourg. Let me just start with Francois. In the picture you painted of the development of German politics, it seemed as if the willingness to participate in military missions out of area would be kind of the touchstone, the benchmark for international responsibility that is being assumed or, or borne by Germany or by the German government and uh, for the integration into the European and transatlantic community instead of a German Sonderweg that is relying on refusal and passiveness. At the same time, and I think it was no coincidence that uh, the participation in the Kosovo intervention was described by you as the climax of this progressive development of German foreign policy. And from then on, kind of a regression was taking place according to you. So at the same time, we don't have an excellent or encouraging track record when it comes to the major military interventions of the past 10 or 15 years. 
And I am pretty certain that this also plays a role in those surveys that were conducted amongst the population. And I quoted them. There is a growing skepticism of the German public vis-a-vis -vis, um, military international responsibility or an international responsibility in military terms. So Afghanistan is on the brink, if I may put this that way, in Libya. I am no expert on Libya, but as far as I follow this as an interested um, contemporary, we cannot say that we can call this a success in the sense of state building in Libya. I'm talking about the intervention here. When it comes to Iraq, we have already spoken about Iraq. The American intervention in many respects uh, turned out to be a disaster when it comes to international law, when it comes uh, to, to regional aspects or humanitarian aspects. So what are the conclusions that we are drawing from these very sobering experiences? When it comes to military interventions, even if politically and morally they would be justified and legitimized by the United Nations, what can they actually do? If we look at the results and if we look at our expectations that this uh, kind of responsibility to protect or enforce peace, that this actually really leads to durable peace and uh, to progress towards democracy, the rule of law, and state building in those countries. So what is the conclusion from the real historical experiences that we made? My second question to Beata Pexa, because for many years, you have been responsible in the field of foreign policy. How do we prevent, with all required willingness, to act in a more assertive way vis-a-vis -vis Russia and to move closer to the border? Also, with regard to the revisionist policy of Europe vis-a-vis -vis Eastern Europe and uh, the Caucasian region. So how do we avoid at the same time to fall back into kind of a bipolar global system where Russia is now seeking refuge? We will see how successful this is in an alliance with China. So an alliance of authoritarian regimes of an authoritarian capitalism. This is also how we could call it. And on the other hand, a transatlantic alliance trying to oppose this. And this in a situation of massive global conflict, be this in Southeast Asia, or be this in the Southern Chinese Sea, or be this in the Near or Middle East, or be it in, the, in Eastern Europe. No matter where, this is not a very trust-building or trust-inspiring concept that we will fall back into kind of a bipolar world order. This would have devastating consequences on the United Nations. Then the Security Council and the United Nations could be just forgotten uh, when it comes to serving as a stabilizing or a peacekeeping power. So what are the ideas? What are the proposals that are made uh, to combine both? the willingness to face conflicts and act in conflicts, and uh, the um, adherence to a multilateral and cooperative international security system. For, for, the, these three, for this excellent set of questions, because it was not simply one question. There are several which were contained in, in, a, uh, in your cluster bomb, if I can put it that way. <laughs> first, first uh, why is military intervention often dealt with as a touchstone, notably by people from France or from Britain when they talk with the Germans or from the States for that matter? Uh, well, for, for a very basic and simple reason, and that is uh, military intervention carries with it by definition uh, uh, ultimate consequences in terms of life and death. 
And that means that the solidarity which happens or doesn't happen has immediate tangible consequences, uh, which are of a different order uh, in terms of their psychological and political resonance uh, than equally important modes or even more important modes of action where the consequences are delayed or less readily visible. That's, that, uh, that's why military intervention is always going to be treated as a touchstone in the, in the discussion with Germany by those countries who have a more assertive policy than Germany. Doesn't mean that they're right to have a more assertive policy, but uh, that explains uh, their, their basic attitude. Secondly, uh, the use of force is part of the spectrum of foreign and security policy. Oh, it always is, at least virtually. And you cannot conduct an effective, efficient foreign and security policy of even the most peaceful nature if you state in advance the potential of the use of force is totally ignored. Uh, let, me, let me give a, a practical example uh, taken from the Twitter world. Uh, I uh, saw so the other day a Twitter message from Jean-Claude Juncker uh, saying that it was very important uh, for Moldova to sign very quickly the association agreement with the European Union. Now, I happen to agree with him on this. I, I think, yes, it is very important. Uh, but I sent a message back saying, but uh, has there been any contingency planning by the people who are negotiating these agreements as to what we will do or not do if as a consequence of the signature our good Russian friends decide, for example, to formalize the annexation of Transnistria. Uh, does that mean that we will, for example, reinforce our military deployments in Romania as part of Article 5 of NATO? Shouldn't we actually be doing that in a preemptive mode to signal to Putin that there is an outer limit, at least vis-à-vis -vis those countries which are covered by Article 5 of NATO. Uh, Putin comes from a world in which one believes in the correlation of forces. And you cannot simply act as if that were not the case. He does believe in this. Uh, third point, what one can achieve with military intervention, intervention is very narrow is very limited and can be very important. And these three elements are not contradictory. Let me take Mali. France intervenes in Mali last Janu in January of last year uh, with essentially no warning time. We had several hours to take the decision and several hours to uh, intervene. If we did not do so in that time frame, Bamako would probably have fallen within the following 48 hours. And we would then have had to deal with the reconquest of a jihadistan in Western Africa, the functional equivalent of what the Taliban achieved in Afghanistan in 1995-1996, with the ultimate consequences that we all know so well. Uh, the French military intervention was totally successful in terms of preventing the emergence of that jihadistan. But beyond that, it serves no purpose. It is not going to provoke the economic and political and social development of Mali. It is not going to resolve the dreadfully difficult issue of the relationship between the, the Tuareg and the Arabs of the north and the people of the savannah and the forest of the south, a problem you have from Mauritania uh, to the Red Sea and every single country which lies astride uh, the Sahara-Sahel uh, region. Uh, you know, starting with Sudan, continuing with Chad, continuing with Niger, continuing with Mali, uh, ending with Mauritania. Uh, these are big, big problems which cannot be dealt with by military intervention in any meaningful manner. Uh, I, w I, I, w I learned to believe some years ago, but I, I'm afraid my belief has sort of waned now, that the EU uh, had the perfect toolkit to deal with broad spectrum treatment of these sort of long-term, big problems. 
uh, and we even had a so-called strategy for the Sahel, which I discovered when we did our intervention in Mali, except it wasn't a strategy, it was a wish list. It was uh, the sort of stuff we call a strategy when we don't know uh, what to actually do. Uh, uh, I, wish, I wish indeed that we were as decisive in terms of our uh, uh, foreign aid programs, in terms of our humanitarian assistance programs, in terms of our political dialogue programs, in terms of our security sector reform programs, in all exact, uh, and, and, the tr and the broad spectrum treatment of the conjoined issues of the funding of terrorism, of narco traffic, and of the trafficking of human beings across the Sahara, with baleful effects on those countries uh, of the southern part of the Eurozone, which are taking all of the heat uh, from these problems. Uh, yes, I wish that we were doing a lot more than counting on French military intervention to resolve all of our problems. Uh, no French military intervention or any other military intervention is not going to resolve 98% of the problems of that part of the world. But we can do something about the 2%. And we did it, and we were right to do so. Thank you, and uh, let me let me start uh, maybe a little bit, you know, on commenting what was just said by <laughs> Dr. Reisberg, uh, because uh, this was something that I also forgotten to say in my first intervention when I was talking about, you know, Germany being sober, you know, partner of of uh, uh, of, uh, of other uh, members of the European Union and the United States. This is this is exactly what what we would count on Germany, uh, you know, uh, knowledge and and experience. Uh, is uh, you know, we all learned after, especially after. Iraq, but also Afghanistan, that, uh, and uh, that was rightly said uh, uh, right now, that, uh, that in Mali, uh, well, finally, you perhaps acted like we learned the lesson, but though still, you know, it's uh, a long way to go, uh, definitely not in Libya. But, th but that's what we would count, you know, that if you, if nobody, uh, nobody forces uh, Germany to, you know, to vote or to uh, uh, to uh, act hand in hand with with France, with Poland on 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 other issues. But we first of all have to discuss, and we can't on the creativity of the new ideas. If you do not want, for example, to go to Libya uh, uh, the way the, it is proposed by France, by, 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 by the United States and by, by the UK, then please come with the new ideas how we should resolve the problem and perhaps we could be you know, won uh, by the argument. So this, this would be you know, something also that, 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 that is needed. And of course, yes, we learned in the European Union, but also um, uh, through, through the recent interventions, but, but uh, 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 also, in in a very difficult, uh, you know, uh, way uh, uh, concerning concerning Libya, that this is uh, uh, well. Of course, it's 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 very uh, um, uh, technical uh, conspec uh, concept of the comprehensive approach, and you know, very diluted in the European Union. But this is something that we will probably have to work on, you know. But of course, not forgetting about the most important, you know, the military resources. We cannot, you know, this is no longer, you know, the time when we can have dividends after the Cold War is over. So, uh, so this is uh, this one thing about uh, about your question and bipolar war and new cold war well we still don't know where we will go definitely i would not agree that you know that the new uh, uh new world older will be bipolar uh and especially you know when uh, when it comes to the alliance you said b between russia and china china is uh, uh is definitely they have their own interest and they have uh, uh and they have their own way to to develop and not uh, not just supporting you know the empire that uh, uh that Putin is dreaming about, you know. So they they started their own modernization. Uh, now they have their own economic problems and internal problems. And uh, uh, and you know sometimes it it may seems to us that seem to us that uh, that uh, uh, they they work together. But uh, but if we for example look at the, at the last uh, discussions over the uh, gas um, uh, um, uh, and oil contract, that was that was you know different. Uh, different, not the political any longer uh, alliance of the of the two, but definitely we need to, uh, 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 beside of course being ready to deter to defend ourselves uh, and to deterrent uh, um, uh, such a situation, uh, uh, we need to uh, we need to uh, keep. Um, 
uh, or, 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 or work on our, uh, on our uh, military posture, that, that's for sure, to be, to be ready. Uh, not, uh, uh, not be uh, shy to intervene when it's, when it's needed, not only by military means. Uh, we have, we ha you know, how many, uh, uh, how many businesses are still going on with Russia, you know, between Germany and Russia? That's what we were saying. Everybody has already forgotten about Crimea and the annexation. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and business is going like, uh, uh, like usual. Uh, nobody wants to talk about sanctions. They're, they are, they're at this moment, there are uh, uh, forces, the uh, Russian forces uh, uh, on, the, on the border with, with Ukraine, and nobody wants to pick up the issue of sanctions. This is how we, sh we, sh we should you know, also, also uh, perhaps um, uh, work on uh, 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 and, and not to allow the empire to, to rebuild itself. And finally, of course, we have to work also on the uh, information part, because, uh, uh, well, that, that is kind of a replay of the Cold War with the Russian propaganda, and we uh, must not uh, perhaps think that our values will def defend our, uh, themselves. Uh, we, we have to spread those values and, uh, and work with, uh, uh, with all partners globally, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, wor working on the exactly multilateral uh, basis and not uh, to uh, create or, or even think about creating, you know, a uh, replay of the Cold War. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Wenn Sie yeah, thank you very much. If you have enough patience, and it seems so, I would like to open one round of discussions now. But please be brief when it comes to your questions and comments. I can only accept a limited number of questions and comments. Sorry for that. Let us start. The first person to claim for the floor was Vinnie Nachtwey. Please use the microphone. Vinnie Nachtwey is my name. From 1994 until 2009, I was a member of Parliament for the Greens, and I was a member of the Defence Committee. So I dealt with crises at the time in a very intense way. Now, as regards foreign policy attitudes of the German nation, obviously the gap is increasing between the Berliners and other people of the population, very roughly speaking. But when it comes to the poll of the Kerber Foundation, you have to take a closer look. And then you will see, here the question actually was, interference or staying out? That was basically the question. And I commented on that. And when I delved into the details, I understood that the answer is, it depends. It depends on the targets and on the measures. This plays a crucial role. And if you have a look at those, then the interpretation is wrong that says that the German population doesn't want to intervene. This is definitely a simplification. You will find a copy outside. And then second point when it comes to responsibility. I told you why I was in charge of foreign policy. I think in contrast to a widespread opinion, especially in the security policy community, we in Germany have all reasons to be a little self-confident. Because if I have, if I take a look at conflict management that Germany was involved, well, first of all, we were quite reliable in contrast to a few other allies. Take a look at the situation at the Balkans. And it was also quite comprehensive. It involved different measures, not only military measures. And when it came to military measures, there was an inclination to participate in the missions that were doomed to success. So we have all reasons to be a little more self-confident. On the other hand, there is no reason for self-complacency because there is a lack of initiatives. There are too few foreign policy initiatives. If something is put at the table in Brussels and New York, then we have to take our own initiatives. However, we are too much in the background. And last point, we have seen in this discussion, and this is also what happened to President Gauck, that responsibility Jakob Augstein also commented on that in the Spiegel magazine, is often interpreted as military responsibility. And this is a simplification. This is definitely wrong. It would be nonsense and wouldn't make any sense. OK, I hope this became clear.
Ursula Hadlensk, member of the Green Party. Vinny, thank you very much for your statement. I totally subscribe to your statement. I think that policymakers have to be more creative. I absolutely subscribe to that. And the Greens in the past years have pointed out that you can do something with civil means. You can work with civil means. In conflict situations, if you have people who are well trained and speak the language, they can interfere in a very effective way. And this could be further developed. Means, funds, and institutions should be created to do that more. This is something where we need much more creativity in the future. Second point, I think that we need many more women in those conflict management systems and programs. We need a systematic approach in order to involve more women. Third point, civil society. Here, a lot needs to be done as well. How come, based on the sources that I have, that Putin in Russia gets much more support than before the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. This is a big problem. And I think that policymakers should also cope with that dilemma. Thank you. Now let's go to the other side. We'll start in the back. The lady, please. The micro is coming. In English because I'm addressing the two speakers who also speak English. Um, my name is Constanze Litt. Uh, in the beginning of this year, I have been elected the youth spokesperson of the German Association for Peace and Security Studies. And you two brought up the issue of involving the younger generation in matters of security policy. And Mr. Eisberg, you asked if there's even an interest. And I can assure you, there very much is. Um, of course, I agree that we have to keep teaching our young generation, and being a member of the um, so-called free generation of um, Europe myself, I can tell you that there is very much an interest even in keeping the education up. Um, for instance, I can tell you the subscription rates, university programs such as international relations, peace and conflict studies, European studies, they're all growing. We, have, we get more and more programs like this. Yet the concern I have heard about very much in, the recent, in my time as a spokesperson is that there's no access for the younger generation to the political decision-making fields. And I mean, even if we're discussing these matters here, I don't see any person below 35 sitting in this panel. So we do have very much an opinion. <laughs> very sorry, I never meant to offend anyone. <laughs> So there are a lot of youth sections of the, of the think tanks, of the associations, which deal with these topics. But I don't see much response from the older generation, so to say, of hearings. Okay. Thank you. Yes, a bit further now. Okay, now. There were two further claims for the floor here in the front. You and then your neighbor, please. Sheng is my name. I want to come back to the concrete European tragedy, and that is Ukraine. What is happening in eastern Ukraine is a war, and this war is not waged by the Ukraine declaring that in doubt we want to annex parts of Russia, but the other way around. Putin still has the mandate has a mandate and has support of parliament to annex the whole Ukraine. Lavrov declared today that only if the Kiev government stops the military operations in the eastern part of the own country, he and his team would be ready to withdraw. So how long will we be waiting? How much longer will we be waiting? Because there is a clear threat of Russia towards this country. What are we going to do? 
I mean, maybe we should impose much more than just sanctions. Sanctions are, of course, effective, but we have to do something in order really to hit Putin in an effective way. A lion's share of our government and of our political establishment and the industry does not really want to do what is politically feasible before military issues that are highly complicated and that should not be used uh, talk about the other. I and mean, we, we say what we should not do, but what could be done is not really implemented and executed. And I wanted to come back to what Mr. Erztemir said. It is nice what you have said, that the German business sector has interconnections and relations with Putin's Russia, and that's that Gazprom is now administering the resources and reserves here, which is total craziness. But weren't the Greens also part of the Schröder government when North Stream was planned and implemented? So a typically German Sonderweg at the expense of our neighbors? OK, and then there's one last question, the lady. My name is Spannagel. I have one question. When looking at the situation between Russia and Ukraine, when listening to your statements regarding those two countries, I was thinking to what extent historic considerations play a role with the treaty negotiators or treaty partners. Haven't they ever thought about in analyzing the historical relationship between the two countries. So have they ever thought about analyzing those relations, the relations between those two countries, and also to anticipate the Kiev, uh, the Kiev Rus? So, well, the question at the end of the day is, to what extent has historical legend any significance in today's negotiations and relations? This is a question I have. Thank you. OK, now we will have a final round on the panel. Unfortunately, we cannot accept all questions from the audience. We have to come to an end. And I would like to start in reverse order, so with Cem Estemir. Please refer or respond to questions and comments that you want to respond to in the end of this discussion. Let me start with what Ursula said. You are absolutely right. Of course, we need to, to strengthen civilian conflict prevention. We also need to enlarge our toolbox. We just uh, briefly spoke about North Africa, but part of the toolbox will, of course, be granting scholarships or granting visas so that future elites can be trained at our universities, can be taught in uh, the ideas of democracy and market economy, and then return back to their home countries. But this should not keep us from also dealing with another reality, that there are some extreme cases where, for whatever reasons, we are faced with a situation where you have the choice of either non-intervening or intervening. And I'm looking at Marie here in the first uh, row. We had one conflict uh, that was taking place in former Yugoslavia in uh, the uh, follow-up wars in Sarajevo. And uh, of course, this is a situation where military intervention does not solve anything. But by not intervening, you are even more guilty. It's not about wrong or right. It's just the choice between two wrong things. But there is one thing that is even more wrong than another thing, and it might be non-intervening. So the analogy with Yugoslavia and Ukraine would be the most befitting one. In a situation where we have the snipers up there and uh, down there we have the people from Sarajevo who stood up for their values, the values uh, stands for that Jews, Muslims, uh, Christians, Orthodox Christians, Protestant Christians, that they all live in one city together, multi-secularism, which is so important to us as Greens, and this is something that was then destroyed from, from above. And they were not shooting at military um, staff, but they were shooting at civilians. And you can't s keep out of this. If you're neutral, you are taking sides as well. And this is the problem with Ukraine. If you say we're a, we're a third party, you know, this is what some people would like to have. Winnie, you are right that we need to watch out how you, we interpret the numbers from the surveys. But there is a deep longing with us. We always want to be a third party. We don't want to be the 
the evil Americans, and we don't want to be the others. But this is not possible in this situation. If you want to be a third party, then you are clearly a party. You are taking sides, and you can't really betray yourself. And I have no problem with people who understand Russia. You know, I would like to see more people who understand Russia and Putin and why he does the things he does. My problem is that I don't like the people who are belittling what uh, what uh, Putin is doing. We have too many of those people around. And um, this um, especially holds true for what is actually going on in eastern Ukraine. This is really postmodern, the way he's doing it, the instruments. He knows exactly how to use them. Uh, he knows that there are no Russian soldiers you need to send out. Um, um, and um, uh, not in Ukraine, not in official uniforms. He is doing this very smartly. He's doing this according to the manner as we know it. You cannot uh, prove this 100 you, percent. You, this is no, not specific enough for the media. You can only allude to this, but you need to be very subtle. And this is exactly the problem we have and which we have to face, especially when we try to point to this North Stream. The problem is not that we are procuring gas from Russia. This is also part of our future. And we need to be honest about this. For the energy turnaround, in the long run, we will have to rely on gas. The problem is, do we do it in a way by a circumventing the Baltic states, or do we do this together with the Baltic states and Poland? That's the problem about how we deal with our Eastern European neighbors when we strike those deals. Let me come back to what I said before. There should be no individual um, service with deal with Gazprom. There needs to be a European deal. This is a language Putin understands. If you want to influence Putin's behavior, this is a way of doing this, striking EU deals and not German ones only. With Mr. Winkler, in the past I discussed already quite a lot, and we argued quite a lot when we were talking about the European enlargement. Maybe it would be a way out also for the Ukraine situation, not in the short run, maybe in the medium or long run, for the question of a possible EU perspective. Maybe the concept of saying that those countries within the EU that want to go further with deepening this, uh, they should do this. And others who do not want to do this don't have to do this, but are still part of the European Union. Maybe this will solve a few problems. It might help us with the Brits. They will then stay in the European Union. I'm always very anxious when I see how generous many are in Germany when it comes to dealing with uh, the UK maybe leaving the European Union, what this would mean for the European Union, also for foreign and security policy. If we look at the European Union, what this would be, what this would look like without the Brits. But this is a different topic, but it might also help you when it comes to the enlargement strategy. If we want to have stability at the borders of the European Union, then we also need to discuss neighborhood policies. And this will not be possible without the European Union using the tool of the enlargement strategy in a proactive way. But we need to learn from the enlargement rounds of the past. You mentioned that. And this also means that other countries, and I hope the French and we Germans will not be impaired from going even further. If we get this together, then we have a toolkit box that will enable us to maybe also give Turkey a chance in a post Erdogan area, uh, era. Sorry. So I'm resisting the temptation of opening up the Turkey debate now, and I'm just limiting myself to Ukraine. I said post Erdogan. Yes, yes. I also like to tell the future, but you know, unfortunately, the historians mostly turn back and they are not the prophets for the future. So, just uh, briefly on Ukraine, your reference uh, to uh, the Kiev of Rus with Putin, we should not take this too seriously. But um, there is a German politician. He is the vice spokesman of the AFD Alliance for Germany, Alexander Gauland. And at the party convention in Erfurt, he did exactly this. He was collecting Russian soil, and he was, or he called the collection of Russian soil as the um, reactivation of a Russian tradition. And this is reactionary. And if we do tolerate this, uh, then we're really reaching the end of everything that we can learn from the post-war era and also from the post-Cold War era. 
Germany and France were the countries that were especially respecting Russian security interests. When in 2008, we were talking about the NATO membership of Georgia and Ukraine. Georgia, uh, under Saakashvili, was not exactly pacifist. They were kind of very offensive and aggressive, and already this was a reason that prevented a serious discussion. So it was good that the debate kicked off by George W. Bush was not continued. And in Ukraine, NATO membership itself was highly contested. Yulia Tymoshenko was opposed to this. Yushchenko was in favor of this, but there has never been a majority. And Ukraine has good reasons to say today, this is not an actual goal we are pursuing right now. So it is legitimate to take the security interests of Russia seriously and also Russian sensitivities. But this is only possible if Russia is pursuing a policy that enables the West to be as flexible and to be as responsible and to be as uh, well thought through and constantly say, oh no, this is something that is never going to happen. I don't think this is a realistic perspective and this is why I would like to um, say this once again, NATO membership should actually be separately dealt with compared to the EU membership perspective. There is no Russian veto right to a Ukrainian application for membership in the EU. Of course, this is no short-term goal. The domestic situation within Ukraine um, means that the Copenhagen criteria will not be fulfilled in the foreseeable future. But what holds true for the Western Balkans also logically needs to apply for Ukraine. I was not happy that the first first reaction to the respective declaration of the newly elected Poroshenko from Paris was, no, this is never ever going to happen. You really need to look at the long-term perspective. Of course, it is the long-term, but an EU perspective and ruling this out, excluding this out, um, a priori, this is certainly not reasonable. This is not a responsible policy. And this is why I do agree with Cem Edstemir, like uh, so often. <laughs> So I'll carry on in German. Let me just briefly clarify that what I meant was the following. When I'm talking about the toolbox of German foreign policy, I never saw this in an isolated way. And now I am using a bad image. Of course, this is a Russian puppet that is uh, kind of also interconnected and uh, seamlessly has uh, to be connected with the European security and uh, foreign policy. But of course, uh, this country can provide them a momentum for a new uh, security strategy because the last paper on this uh, is already 10 years old. The consequences of a military intervention. Let us be very clear about this and we are completely here um, on the same opinion. This doesn't mean we have no interests in Iraq. We uh, built up the legal system there. We train people over there that were precisely trained in order to remedy and solve the problems that exist over there right now. And all of a sudden, there are no consequences to the wave of ISIS terrorism. But it cannot be in the German national interest that we only start the scenario planning very late. Let us not talk about military means. If we have excellent bureaucrats, technocrats, lawyers, and we do have this over here in Germany, and if we consider a military invention or try to think about it, yes or no, we need to have a, a scenario planning at every level just as it was done in the 1950s by Dwight D. Eisenhower in the United States. We need to know what we're buying into, but then the consequence should not be keeping out, but we need to just be smarter when we go in. And we have those possibilities. We just need to bring them together. And we means we as Germans or us Germans. 
At the end of the day, we're talking about the propaganda machine. I was so surprised as a transatlantic expert. I cannot believe that we have NSA, and then uh, we have nothing to counteract the propaganda machine of Putin. The article of uh, the Süddeutsche Zeitung with the um, gremlins, this is something that really scares me. This cannot really be true. This is something which I don't understand, that we don't have any means to counteract this, to oppose this, and I find this is highly unbelievable. So the first approach would be transferring the NATO bases to the east. And this, of course, is realpolitik. But of course, we can also use completely different tools and approaches. And then we have the younger generation. Yes, of course, we need to also get them on board. This is extremely important. But this also means that these interconnections are made visible, are made transparent. I, I feel very flattered that I am also believed to be under the age of 35. But this really is part of it. We need to interconnect the problems so that they are really having um, an aspect to them so that the younger generation can relate to them. And this also involves uh, getting crisis management right and getting the right people on board. Uh, first, the toolbox. Uh, in my duties in, in Geneva, at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, we run, we run courses in Baku uh, for senior Afghanistan civil servants, uh, uh, about 40 every year. And I went uh, a couple of years ago to one of these courses, and I was uh, initially surprised to see that uh, the, the vernacular language uh, between the locals, but also between the Afghanistan people, was Russian. And I understood very quickly why, because these senior people, uh, these were 45, 50 men and women, the uh, proportion of women was actually quite high, which uh, and he, he, that also has an explanation. Uh, they had been trained in the closing days of the Soviet Union, uh, in the various universities, in Kharkov, in Kiev, in uh, 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 Leningrad, and so on, a, a master's level or doctoral level. And so I did a bit of digging, and I realized that the Soviets were training during their uh, Afghan period, between the, the early 1970s and the mid-1990s, they were training 2,000 people a year at that level. 2,000 a year at the master's and doctor's level. Uh, very, very impressive. We have been spending hundreds of billions of dollars in military intervention in Afghanistan. I have not been able to find our own statistics on the number of people that we were training in our universities at the master's and the doctoral level, which is another way of saying that we have not even perceived the need to have a focused, coordinated program of senior training for Afghanistan at that level. Uh, but I understand that the numbers are about one-fifth of the numbers of the Soviet Union. So to have to point to the Soviet Union as a model of civilian intervention in Afghanistan in comparison to what we have been doing sort of makes me hurt. This is, you know, this is not great. We do not lack the resources. We simply did not think about it. And that, by the way, includes Germany. And uh, I also note that Germany's overseas development assistance budget, in terms of percentage of GDP, is not nearly at the same level as the Scandinavians, or even at the level of the Brits or the French. And, uh, and it goes well, yeah, but then the, the French would do that too. Uh, uh, and that is sort of strange uh, because, you know, one can understand a narrative of military restraint. It's much more difficult to understand a narrative of development assistance restraint. I mean, where does that come from? Uh, apart possibly from, uh, uh, I want to keep my money, I want to keep my money. Uh, Ukraine. Uh, Sanctions are necessary, including, I would add, because I don't want to appear to be self-serving, uh, that should include the non-delivery of the French Mistral ships. That, uh, I am unambiguous about that. I've, I've been on the record on this for quite some time, uh, but I restate it here. 
the sanctions are necessary, but as other people here tomorrow will point out to you, people uh, like Ivan Krastev or Daniela Shefa, with whom I went to Moscow a couple of months ago, it was quite clear that sanctions were not going to change Putin's course. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do them, but they're not going to solve the problem. Uh, a strategy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine is going to take time to unfold. This is a big issue, and it's one with, uh, it is not going to be, there are no quick fixes. In a sense, it's not like the Iran sanctions were two years ago. Uh, so what does, what does that mean? Well, that means that we have to start straight away to do the long-term stuff. And what is the long-term stuff? A, energy policy must not simply be dealt with at the EU level or at the national level as an issue which has to do with climate change, pollution, or the internal market, which is the main dimension of energy treatment today by all of our countries, more or less well, but by all of our countries. It's also a security problem. It is a security problem as well. And if we treat it as a security problem, policies will have to change in Germany and in France and elsewhere. Uh, secondly, and quite immediately, and here I, I go entirely along with what you said, NATO has to prove to itself and to Mr. Putin uh, that we actually believe in our own treaties. Article 5. If we do not take our own defense seriously, it is unlikely that Putin will treat it seriously. And what do I see today? The only countries which have moved hardware forward towards the East, Canada, United States, United Kingdom, France, Denmark, and Poland, because you've moved stuff to the Baltics. Uh, end of story. I remind you that there are 28 member states in NATO. Do most of the other ones really not give a shit about their own defense? And that is the only conclusion that Putin can draw from what we are not doing. Thirdly, support of Ukraine, essential, that's just been discussed. Uh, but that must include, as it has included for other neutral countries, because for the moment we must consider Ukraine as a neutral country, it's not, it's not a member of NATO, it's not a member of the European Union, but it should be treated not basically differently than from the way we treated during the Cold War, Sweden or Finland, that is, we provided them, they got Marshall Plan aid, they got heavy economic assistance, they got access to Western security and defense assets, advice and armaments. Uh, Ukraine must be treated as, uh, as a long-term investment. You know, 25 years ago, Poland and Ukraine had the same standard of living. Today, Poland has three times the standard of living of Ukraine. We want to see Ukraine in 25 years having the same standard of living as Poland. Going upwards, of course, not downwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I definitely hope so that, uh, you know, at least, uh, at least Ukraine will have, will have the current uh, status of living of Poland. Uh, Maybe, maybe sooner than even in the 25 years. Uh, well, uh, just, just just shortly on, on, on Putin. Putin seems to be, uh, someone said, you know, his popularity is growing in, in Russia. I see it's growing all over Europe. And then during this conference, you know, he's the main person that uh, uh, that we are uh, 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 talking about. And, and well, let, let it be, okay? Let it be. I mean, he is trying to rebuild the empire. He is very capable. Uh, we may... Uh, uh, we may even admire, you know, his capacities to be a, a leader of his country, but please do not buy his propaganda and, you know, and the and the propaganda machine uh, of, of of Russia. If I hear that uh, that there there are you know fascists on every corner in Ukraine, in Kiev, but not only in Lviv, in in in, in Donetsk, uh, I'm 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 sorry, it's 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 not true. If I hear that there is a genocide uh, uh, comparable to the Rwanda than genocide in Eastern Ukraine. This is what, what, what our colleagues in Africa here 
from from Russian diplomats. That 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 is that is something that we have to oppose. And if we hear about you know the the uh, 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 um, perhaps need for reflection on the historical uh, um, uh, agreements or historical approaches between Ukraine and and Russia, then we may of course then dream you know what kind of uh, borders in Europe you would like to see. Maybe we should then, you know, reflect about, you know, how European borders should look like. It's not the way we should we should approach this. Then we hear that, that Russia is doing justified things because they um, we promised that NATO will never enlarge, and NATO is enlarging because you know there are a few fighters from America now stationing in Poland, and this is this is again this is what is being said to our African Asian colleagues uh, uh, all over globally, also also uh, via Russian television that is uh, available in many languages and provide it for free. So we perhaps should also uh, uh, um, uh, stand, uh, uh, stand against this type of, uh, of propaganda uh, uh, as well. And... Uh Well, well, let's continue. Well, we disagree on this, and definitely there are documents that are uh, uh, that are uh, that are there to be studied, perhaps uh, um, uh, uh, as well as many uh, um, publications on this. Uh, and on the Eastern uh, policy, perhaps we'll be talking tomorrow a little bit more during the, the technical uh, conference. And, but uh, we we have to we have to talk also openly about the about the future of Europe, uh, and. Uh, 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 and uh, and the enlargement of, of Europe, uh, which will not happen, of course, overnight. But uh, well, thanks. We we still remember in Poland that it was also thanks to Germany, not only the United States, that we became you know members of NATO, but thanks to Germany, uh, uh, support of Germany finally, and uh, well, and other uh, countries like France, uh, we became EU member, and and our uh, GDP is now three uh, three times higher than Ukrainian, uh, but now but because of course also of the hard work of Poles, but. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, <laughs> just uh, among others, but uh, you know, we, we at at one point we 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 came to the situation. We were in the situation where we were denying those countries that are uh, you know on the eastern uh, behind the eastern border of Poland to call them Europeans. Uh, we had problems, you know. One country, okay, we is is being called the Eastern European because we couldn't admit that this is the European country when we were adopting the EU documents. Uh, and and it's enlargement will not happen overnight. As I said, they will have to fulfill. You know, those countries have to fulfill criteria. But we cannot build ourselves. You know, put in these building walls. We cannot allow ourselves to build walls in Europe. We have to support these countries in their development, in their reforms, uh, and and definitely, you know, to oppose uh, uh, oppose any aggression uh, um, uh, 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 against any of these countries, as they are as they are European countries. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panelists and thank you also to the audience for your staying power. Because we have been discussing this for nearly three hours now and this has been really um, adequate to the topic that we were dealing with in this debate. It was living up to the topic because I think it was a very knowledgeable discussion as far as I'm concerned and it was also very serious and it was not a discussion amongst Germans about foreign policy but it was a true dialogue with our allies and friends. And exactly this political culture of an international foreign policy debate is what we would like to make a contribution to. And this is what the annual foreign policy conference is for. It is not the only conference that is dealt with like this. Nearly every two weeks, you will find an international event that is taking place with us. And this is an essential contribution to qualifying the foreign policy discussion in Germany because uh, we are far too little thinking out of the box. And 
Last but not least, I would simply like to come back to what has been said a couple of times. I am deeply convinced that this Ukrainian crisis has a historical significance also for the European Union, not only for Ukraine itself and its political and economic and social perspectives. This is a, a stress test for the European Union as a political project. And if we can resist the stress test and face this, then we have the chance of reactivating the EU as a political project. If we fail, then this is going to have devastating consequences also for the cohesion within the European Union. And this is why we need to take this as our joint um, affair and something which is close to all our hearts. Thank you very much.